remember my first time I heard Les Polymery Ford on the radio. I thought it was magic. And I just always, lo and I love to sing. So I just, I thought being a singer would be a great thing. Except the only problem was I was scared to death to stand in front of an audience. So I worked at the Ice House for two years. I did a hoot once a month, a hoot nanny at the Ice House once a month. And then a hoot nanny at the Troubadour once a month for two years. So I did, between the two, I did 48 sets and got over my stage fright. And how quickly did you get over your stage fright? Took two years. Of doing so only towards the end months. of that spell, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I got, I, I, knew, I had met Doug Weston, the guy who owned the Troubadour. And uh, he came up to me and said, you're ready to go professional now, Russ. And that meant a great deal to me. And when, when did you first realize, you know, you were a great singer? Well, I never, I still don't think of myself as a great singer. I can get, I can hit the notes, that's about it. <laughs> <laughs> I never think of myself as what a was the What was the first time you picked up a guitar? Uh, when I was a kid, probably about 15. I bought, I bought a guitar for 50 bucks from a guy down the street. Gibson, I think it was an LG5 or something like that. Started playing mostly folk music, blues. And I, I just liked it. And the beginnings of the association, were they in the Troubadour? Well, uh, I knew Terry and Jules from just, they'd come in and hang out. And then later, uh, at one of the hoots I was at, they started doing hoots. They, everyone who was playing would do a hoot, and they, they were calling it the inner tubes. And it'd be like 10 or 15 people on stage. And they'd just do folk music and stuff like that. I think Doug Dillard uh, was the instigator of it to begin with. But anyway, they decided to take names and form a band, and it seemed too big for me, so I didn't put my name in. Right. So later that band formed, the men, and uh, uh, after they had been together a while, they, they, trimmed, they were 13, they trimmed down to 11, then their lead singer, uh, Barry McGuire, left the Christie's. And their lead singer was hired out of the men by the Christie's to take his place. So Jules and Terry came to me and said, Russ, would you like to join our group as a lead singer? I said, well, I said, it's an awfully big group. So I said, well, come down, we'll do a set for you. So I went down and I sat with their manager, just me and their manager, and they did like five or six songs. Outstanding, I was thrilled. I went, yeah, I'll join your band. You know, so I joined the band, and this guy had a notebook, and he was talking to Terry, he says, well, you said you were gonna talk to this record company, and then, uh, He's going on, and I, I'm sitting there, I don't even know what this guy's talking about. Yeah, I'm just, I'm sitting right next, next to him. And Jules is right next to me, and Jules all of a sudden stands up and says, I'm tired of this bullshit, I just want to make music, I'm out of here. <laughs> he stands and walks out, and I said, you know, I don't even know what you're talking about. I gotta go with Jules. So I sort of walked out, Ted, Brian walked out, yeah, and, and, and Terry, Terry stood up and said, you know, you just lost your band. <laughs> you know, we walked out and met on the street. We met at Terry's house. We picked a name that night. We started rehearsing the next day as the association. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> and when did you first gig? Because I, I, I read that you were actually rehearsing for, for like quite a, we quite a while. We rehearsed for five or six months. Uh, Why was that? Did you not even try and get anything? Well, it was, we had, we knew, uh, we weren't look, really forming ourselves to be like anyone, but we knew what kind of music we wanted, and it took a while to work it out, you know, to, to do the, the, those are complex arrangements. Very complex. And to figure out exactly what we were. And who, yeah. are there, is there anyone that, who you were directly influenced by? Well, we were influenced by every, everyone has ever sung, you know, groups, you know, every group, you know, but, uh, we never formed ourselves to be like anyone. You know, it was just, uh, it was our own kind of art. Yeah, you know, it was it our own, is. you know. I, I've, I've had a lot of people ask me to, to, to define our music, and it's pretty hard to define. It's just like Requiem, Requiem for the Masses. How are you going to define that? It's just art. You know, we just it did is. art, and we were lucky enough to have some, some hits out of it, you know. How did you go about in a, because, 
I've seen and heard people try and do things like windy. Oh yeah, yeah. And fail disastrously at trying to do it. Well, if if uh, I'll tell you the greatest greatest story, we were working with an orchestra, and the uh, the maestro said we were taking the whole band, our band, and the orchestra was taking a break, and the the maestro said to me. Can I talk to you for a second? And we walked into the wings and he said, I studied with Bernstein, you know, conducting. And every morning, every morning before class, Bernstein would welcome everybody into the class, stand at the door. So one day, he just sat at a desk and he had a, a portable record player. And when everybody was seated, he put on Windy on the record player and he played it and then he said, now that is a perfect record. I mean, it is. The greatest compliment I ever received. But we worked on that turkey to make it perfect. Yeah, we worked very hard on that. But that was the greatest compliment I ever received. And I wasn't even there. I just, the, <laughs> the, the conductor told me about it. I mean, it is a perfect record. How it did is. The, how did the harmony, who arranged the harmonies? Was uh, that together? was Clark Burroughs and us. And we changed as we went. Like at the end where it seems to repeat, over and over, it actually changes a little bit at yeah, each repeat. Yeah, you know, the chord changes a little bit, and uh, we were we worked so hard on the record, the tenors started giving way at the end. <laughs> so some of the ladies, my wife Bertie, uh, Clark Burrow's wife, the girl who wrote the song, uh, stepped in to to get the the, the fade right. Though you can never tell, our guys really sang high. We had some real yeah. tenors in the group. So you can't even tell, but there are three ladies helping us out. Yeah, so th now that you mention it, you can yeah. tell what you mean, but you can't, it's just... It's hard to tell because the guys, the guys, the, our tenors were such real tenors. You know, they were, but we worked all day on that song. You and know, how difficult is it to do live? Easy. Easy? Easy. Why is it easy? Just well, because you already know it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> as we're doing it, we're changing as we go. We go, well, this could use an extra voice here. You know what I mean? You're experimenting, you're listening, you, you record, then you go back in and you're listening. You go, well, that could use another note here, another, you know, where I'll tell you how we started doing it. We, were, we had just recorded a tune and released it. We were on the road. We were driving to the next gig, which I think was a college. And uh, Windy came on the air. We had just left the studio like a couple of weeks before. It was already had been started becoming a hit. So we had, well, we better add that tonight. We had never <laughs> well, done it. Was it. not even in the set. We had never done it. Oh so we did it. We we added it during sound check. Oh my god. So, but, but, so did did you not when you finished that record? Did you not think after it right? That's it. That is going to be such a big. I record. didn't know, but I had it while I was singing the lead. I I thought, you know, I remember saying to the guys in the booth, I said, you know, Windy, I said, the Windy City, this is going to kick some ass in Chicago. And indeed it, it did. It did. <laughs> it did. <laughs> Chicago it was like, a, se was like a second second home to us. Chicago was fantastic. It was great to us. It still why did, is. Why did you feel such an affinity with Chicago? Well, number one, there's Chicago, and then there's all these cities. So you can stay in Chicago and work like 10 smaller cities that are like 30, 40 miles away. And it was so just, it's just, it's just a big center. It's a big center for, it was a great center for us. We had great drivers. We had the same drivers. You know, this, the, Doc and George. Doc was big. We call him Doc because of Doc Savage, the fictional detective, this big, big body guy, because he looked like him. So we called him Doc, and the other guy was smaller, Doc and George. And they were your drivers in Chicago. They were our drivers. I'll tell you what, this is in the book. One time we were driving in from the airport, and Brian, our bass player, Brian Cole, saw uh, a fire helmet next to the freeway. So he had the guy pull over. So he got the fire helmet. We returned it to the fire department. It was like a second or third generation helmet. <laughs> so it was pretty major. So we were, you know, the entire Chicago fire department was our fans. 
<laughs> yeah. You know, after that. Yeah, you know, after that. After that story just went like spread like wildfire. <laughs> wildfire. Well, wildflower. Wildfire. <laughs> yeah. It was great. And so during the sixties you said you were gigging like two hundred oh, days. Oh yeah, we a were year on two hundred, two hundred and fifty days a year we're on the road. And it was pretty early on actually that you had your first hit, wasn't it? <gasps> Uh, we weren't gigging that much until we had our first hit. We were working steadily, but we weren't traveling much. But once our first hit and cherish hit, we were on the road. You your, fir your first hit was a long, a long time. Long comes Mary. Well, yeah. I think it went to number five or six or seven, six. I think. Yeah. It was a long time. And ago. was that was that a surprise when it when that hit? Well, it was a surprise because it was a B side. Was it? Someone flipped it over, and it, it just as they did, there's a saying in the business: a record has legs. Yeah. It had legs, and about half the stations wouldn't play it because they thought it was about marijuana. Yeah. And yeah. it was a hit anyway. <laughs> was it about marijuana? I I think it was. I didn't never wrote it. And we the reason we got the tune "Jewels" played on the demo. With Tan and Alma wrote, and Kurt produced a demo. Kurt Petcher, our first producer, and he brought back an acetate. An acetate is like a a small record that's good for about a dozen, you know, twenty plays. But Jules brought the demo back to our group house, where four of us lived. Two of two of us, two guys lived with their ladies. And Jules brought this back and said, "Listen to this record. And put it on. Put it on the machine." Everybody went, "Holy moly!" And we just started working on it. We, that's the only tune we never wrote it on. You, you just, we just heard it and started doing it. We wrote down what we thought the words were. They weren't, of course. But we found out we got the real words later. But the next day, when we started rehearsing, we played it for the other guys, the other two, Terry and Brian, and they both went, "Wow." So we just started working on it because it was a great tune. And what, and it was, Unique. It was the B side to what? Uh, I think it was a tune called Your Own Love. You tell me you want me for your lover. <laughs> it was a nice tune, but not as good not as, as good. Mary. Did, Mary. Did you not think Mary at the time that it should have been the A side? I didn't know A side, B side. I had no idea. I you know I've never I had never played the record game before. So, so we, you, we were just we, it was just a crapshoot for us. Yeah. So, so you were just keen to do your job. We just, and do it well. we just wanted to get a record on the charts, so we could tour and do concerts. And you said to me earlier that you wanted to, you know, you you were incredibly grateful to be singing. Oh yeah, for a uh, Pat Colecchio, our manager at the time, once said to me in his office, he said, "All the guys in the band asked to be on the road less and to make more money, except for you, Russ. You never asked that." Said, well, I'm grateful to be working, to be singing for a living. Yeah, it is a wonderful thing. It, it's 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 heavenly. It was a heavenly. It's been a. I've had a great life. It's been a very blessed life for me. And did did it ever get old, gigging? Not for me. Yeah, what got old was people haggling, you know, the haggling between the in the group, you know, about just nothing. I remember one at a meeting, one guy said. You shouldn't wear shorts on the airplane. You know, I always wear tailored shorts when I wore shorts. They weren't raggy or anything. But at a business meeting, this guy's talking about the war is going on. And he's talking about my shorts. Give me a break. <laughs> so we had earlier discussed uh, that we gave give a six month notice if yeah. we were leaving. So this, this question really got to me. And the other piddly, just piddly stuff. Nothing, stuff that meant nothing. I went, so I asked the lawyer, I said, was it six months to notice that we have to give, we're going to leave? He said, yeah. I said, well, you got mine. And I sort of walked out and left the band. When was that? Early uh, 70s. 70. I was with the band five or six years. And then. Uh, what made you want to leave? Just that. Like that. The shorts. <laughs> Just these stu stupid stuff. Stupid, what inconsequential stuff, inconsequential, unimportant. And what, did you find that that was, I mean, I guess that's the case. It was just a lot, let's say, it was the last straw. The final straw. The straw, the, the straw that broke the camel's back. Indeed. You know, 
So, so anyway, I do was. You regret that? Do you regret that decision? Ah, uh, well, it probably would have been better if I stayed. I, I really haven't. I've been working. I worked on all kinds of projects since. You released you know, a solo album in the early seventies. I did a solo album. I was a half a comedy comedy duo for a couple of years. <laughs> I worked as a carpenter. I worked as I uh, worked as nice man. And then. And then the group, uh, they had a, uh, a sh an HBO show called Then and Now, and they wanted to get the band back together, and they offered us so much money, and Terry said, I don't think anybody's going to go for this. Terry was working on the show. He was part of the staff. He said, I don't think anybody's going to go for this, and he called us all up, and every guy said, no, <laughs> every guy. So they doubled the money. And they said, you only have to do five songs, you only have to rehearse on the weekends, and you can go Every back. Every guy said no. Every guy. Why? You'd have to ask Getting every on guy. Getting stuff, yeah. yeah. Different reasons. So, but they have, they offered us more money. And they said, look, you only have to do five songs, and you only have to rehearse on the weekends. So we did, it was great. I mean, the first song we sang, I mean, everyone was in, was in tears. It was so beautiful. I mean, it was just gorgeous. So we did it. We did the show, and we all went back back to our jobs and our lives. And uh, really, after that, you oh yeah, no, we didn't get back. So uh, an agency called uh, Terry and said, "We're getting a lot of requests for after the show aired. We're getting a lot of requests for you guys." Could you get back together and do them? So they, uh, we we took a loan of I think, I think it was ninety thou. And so for clothes and am amplifiers and stuff, we started back on the road. And since and I was with them from nineteen eighty to twenty thirteen. Wow. And mo mostly standing ovations. So another 33 years on the road? Yeah. Wow. And so were you touring every year from 1980? Oh, yeah. The, the only year that was difficult was after 9 11. Oh, right. After 9 11, things just got all similar. Well, just no one wanted to watch like I just, I, I guess that was just the reaction to it. It was pretty heavy. I mean, it tore me up. I mean, all those people, all those innocent people. I don't think of them as, as Americans who were killed. I think of them as my brothers and sisters. And they weren't Americans. They were people from all over the world. Yeah, they were. Yeah, I've, I heard people on the news say 3,000 Americans. They weren't all Americans. Only some of them were Americans, but they were all my brothers and sisters. Yeah, I think that's a very good way of looking yeah, it, it at it. Yeah, it crushed me. It just, I was, uh, when it happened, I thought, this is going to be in the tens of thousands. I was amazed that it was only 3,000 people. And when, when those amazing uh, um, arrangements of harmonies got put together, was that, did, did you guys just all figure it out by some of it? Some of it was done, Jules, Jules Alexander, our lead guitarist, is a wonderful arranger. He did some of it, some stuff was just head arrangements. We just start singing a tune, and, and the tenors would sing a tenor part, and the baritones would sing the baritone part, and the basses would pick a bass part. And we just got, that's the way Mary, Mary was a head arrangement. That bop a doo wow, bop doo wow. That's just, uh, it's an old jazz thing. Bop doo wow, you, you know. Yeah. It was, we just threw it in there. Yeah, I really do think it's some it was of fun. the most incredible vocals. Really, it's really stood the test of time. And yeah. Do you, listen, do you listen to much music nowadays that comes out? I listen to, um, a little bit, but uh, I listen to a lot of jazz, and I love Django Reinhardt. I think he's the best guitarist that ever walked the earth. He was brilliant. Yeah, I don't think anyone comes close. And do, do you? No one. Do you think that the '60s and '70s and the musicianship, and you know, the part of pop music culture that you guys were a part of, do you think that will ever be repeated? Does it, do you like uh, the I think there the are still some great musicians. There have been great musicians in every decade. Yeah. But uh, I think the, there's certain things from the 50s and 60s will live forever. Yeah. I mean, I, I love Desmond Decker, you know, the Israelites. 
one of my favorite records. That is a great I, yeah, song. I love the I love the you know this individual records that you know. They're just there's still a lot of people, of but they're they're modern people and you know they're still uh, pretty talented and sing very well. You know. For sure, for sure. But it's always interesting to get people's view, views on that. Um, so in in this series, uh, I always like to finish off by asking two questions. Apart from the big hits that you know people are already going to know the yeah. association for, what what are your favorite you know lesser known tracks? Uh, on the first album, I love "Message of Our Love." <laughs> message of our love, you heed the message. You know that's a great tune. I love uh, "Go Blame the Rain," or sometimes it's called "Don't Blame the Rain." I love uh, there's a tune on on the uh, Inside Out album that one of our guitarists, Mike DC, wrote called "What Ain't Gettin." Love that song. Uh, there's another tune uh, on a, an album after that called "Come On In." It's an old. Uh, I remember a lot of folk singers used to do it. And uh, they actually did it at my suggestion, you know, but we did a whole different range to it. And I love, I love uh, a lot of the album cuts. I like that, or you know, they're just, they're interesting tunes. And they're great art. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, not much more. Just simply art. And in this series, which is celebrating the greatest of all time, who would you pick as you know your favorite of all time? <coughs> well, I'll tell you, one of the greatest singers that ever walked the face of the earth is Aretha Franklin. I do agree with yeah, that. Yeah, we never played with her, and I always wished we had played with her. Because he just, I mean, from early on, uh, Ray Charles, you know, these are, these are people. I, I saw a TV show once, Ray Charles was playing and Aretha was singing. Wow. And after she was taking a bow, she was standing right next to Ray, and I heard Ray, it wasn't a mic, it was off mic, but I heard him say, we know what you're doing, honey. You know. Oh, she did know. Yeah. And so did he. Yeah, yeah, yeah. oh yeah. yeah. That was what Ray I Charles did. hasn't been mentioned enough when people are answering. Oh yeah, Ray been. Charles. Incredible. The first three concerts I saw were Josh White, Sabikas, the flamenco guitarist, and Ray Charles, with the Ray Lance and the big band. At the Russ Auditorium in San Diego. I can't remember which one was first. Wow. But, then, but at both the uh, the Ray Charles concert and the Sabika's concert, there were a tremendous amount of surfers. Flamenco was very popular in San Diego at that time. And uh, there, were a lot of, there were a lot of surfers who were... And they were sitting in the front row with, with binoculars to watch his hands. <laughs> You see how he did it. I see how he played. Yeah. He was incredible. He was an incredible guitarist. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And I remember during when Ray Charles was there, before he went it came on, there were all these servers sitting there. A lot of them had shades just like Charles. And they're going, <laughs> Bring on the priest, bring on the priest. <laughs> it was great. It was great. I liked it very much. Well, that must have been an amazing experience. Yeah, it world. was great. He was great. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a very good answer. <laughs> good. Well, Russ, thank you. It's been a real pleasure. My pleasure. A pleasure thank to do this.